1962, Rauschenberg was pulling the images of things into his paintings by means of silkscreen. News photos mainly, records of current events, the flux of the media. He wanted to create a new sort of history painting on the old panoramic scale. I've been to probably no fewer than a dozen uh, of the Apollos and uh, the shuttle shots. And it's always excited me and it's the, there's hope in that, that, that tremendous surge of energy and the sound the liftoff makes that uh, it's not of this world. There's a very strong feeling that America is presenting you suddenly with this flow of images which are really, really strong and in some way unprecedented, the space program, Kennedy, all this. Did you feel that you were living in really exceptional times when you were doing these? Well, I had to be aware of that. I mean, I certainly couldn't have done that work under Nixon or nearly anybody else. It's not the dramatic drive and the uh, imagination that, uh, that's ever reoccurred uh, since that period. I had just invested in six-foot silk screens of Kennedy with the hand. With the pointing finger? Yes. And in that context, he was like authority, the president, and now he was not authority, he was not uh, president, he was a dead tragedy. Kennedy's death wasn't only a colossal blow to American self-confidence. It was one of the watersheds from which the present fragmentation of American society flowed. I am happy to join with you today in what will go down in history as the greatest demonstration for freedom in the history of our nation. We shall overcome. We shall The 1960s brought one of the greatest moral struggles in American history, the civil rights movement. Some black writers in the process rose from national to international fame, among them James Baldwin and Richard Wright, the novelists. And yet the visual art seems strangely silent on the subject of black identity and experience. Why? Because white artists, critics, collectors, the whole art world in fact, good liberals to the last man, tended to regard blacks as a kind of social abstraction. Romare Bearden's collages of life in the South and in Harlem set out to change this. They are among the greatest expressions of African-American culture. They belong with the work of Duke Ellington and Earl Hines in music or Alvin Ailey in dance. As an artist, Bearden was not a cultural separatist and he never bought the line that art had to be abstract to matter. It could report on its place, its time, its people. He drew on Picasso, on Matisse, even on Dutch genre painting, whatever was useful. And on African art as well, cycling the forms of masks and statues back into the living Harlem that was all around him. He was in Harlem uh, after all the 1920s saw the birth of jazz. And that aesthetic was very much a part of the way that he saw. And he found a way, I think unlike any other African-American artist before him, 
of representing that aesthetic visually. He found a visual language for an aesthetic which we had experienced mostly in verbal and musical forms through great attainments in African-American music. Well, Bearden found a way to encapsulate that aesthetic visually. And his collage technique is the closest visual analog to jazz rhythms and improvisation that I at least have encountered. To be an American was to have too much most of the time. It was to live in a permanent inflation of desire. The English invented the sandwich, and then they did nothing with it for 200 years. A miserable flap of bread with a little smear of mustard on a transparent piece of ham. Pathetic. Not here. Turkey, corned beef, Swiss cheese, roast beef, American cheese, pastrami. The only problem being, as the conquistador said on the edge of the Grand Canyon, how do you get down into it? Sandwich as metaphor. American artists had rejoiced in the mythic bigness of their country. It was one of the great themes of the 19th century. And then, in the late 50s and 60s, they began to get into the bigness of ordinary life. The artist who latched onto this aspect of America, so weird to the foreigner, was Klaus Oldenburg. He was the best of the pop artists in the 1960s, and pop art, as Andy Warhol said, was about liking things. I think there are many types of American food, but the sort of food that I was using here was the simpler forms that have a kind of architecture, and they're found in very simplified fast food. The hamburger is a, is a perfectly structural piece of food, and, and I think I'd almost rather look at it than eat it, you know, but it is fun, it's got, it's got three circles, and if you put an onion on it, you have even more variation, and then a pickle is even more variation, and so on. So it's very often a structure which is covered with a very textured surface. In 1961, Oldenburg moved into a store on the Lower East Side and began to fill it with things. The store was a parody of an art gallery, nothing but a shop with art in it. Out of cheap sleazy materials, plaster, rags, shiny paint and junk, he made shoes, shirts, stockings, knickers, all unwearable, all absurd. Almost all of the works can be related to the body in some way because they are objects handled by a human being so they relate to uh, the feeling of a human being and then they also are uh, imagined they, they stimulate the imagination of human beings so they all refer all the objects refer to human experiences Americans were the first people to completely adapt to mass advertising. It bombarded them with thousands of messages a day. It shaped their dreams, it interrupted their landscapes, and it helped form their cities. Its monumental form was the billboard, and one artist got his training by painting them high above Times Square. I was working as a sign painter in the Union in Times Square, and I'd paint a huge 60-foot long glass of beer beautifully, with bubbles and the right yellow and everything. And the salesman would come in and says, James, that beer doesn't have enough hops in it. He said, you got to change it. I said, what do you mean? 
What do I know from hops? He says, well, make it a little lighter. I made it one thousandth degree lighter, the whole damn thing. That's good, it passes. Next day, <clears throat> paint an arrow shirt 20 feet high. James, the collar looks dirty. You've got to change the collar. You've got a dirty shirt. Doesn't, they're not going to pass it. So I had all this color. I had uh, Ford seafoam green. I had dirty beer, beer color, the wrong hops. I had dirty arrow shirt collar. I took that paint home and made abstract paintings, and only I knew that this was the wrong color. Then it dawned on me, why don't I try to make a mysterious painting by doing enlarged fragments, and the largest fragment would be hardest to see and therefore be mysterious. So Lawrence Alloway came along, and he called it pop art because the artists loved their images so much. <laughs>